know, it's not like it used to be. <laughs> chain of onshore stations soon dotted the east coast of the South Island mainly from Fiordland to the Marlborough Sounds and a dozen or more towns large and small owe their origins to the whalers who came on shore and put down roots on land. Towns like Porirua, Kaikoura, Akaroa, Moraki, Bluff, Riverton and so on. A few of the owners of whaling stations experienced brief prosperity, but none of them did quite so well as the man who owned half a dozen Otago and Southland whaling stations, including the one at Waikuaiti. This began as one of eight stations owned by a rough-fisted Sydney cider called Johnny Jones. For 15 years, Johnny Jones dominated whaling and trading along the Morihiku coast. In 1838, he changed tack and shipped in settlers from Port Jackson. At Cornish Head, he started a farm. The produce from the farm fed both the settlers and the families on his whaling stations. The chances are that he was a convict's son. And yet, while theorists in London were still writing books about the principles of planned colonial settlement, Johnny Jones had already done it all. He built everything you'd find on an English country estate. Although many of his buildings still stand, Johnny Jones's land claims didn't last. He thought he'd bought from the Maori 16,000 hectares. He ended up with a title to little more than 1,000 hectares. And Jones wouldn't have been able to build any kind of community if it hadn't been for his close association with one man. The man that Jones and other whaling captains dealt with in acquiring Maori land was Tu Hawaiki, King of the Bluff, he was known. He was also known, though much more widely, as Bloody Jack, simply because of his uh, long association with whalers and sealers out of Port Jackson and his persistent use of the Australian adjective. <laughs> 